All right, and we're back with the human geography of Antarctica. And because there's not many people in Antarctica, there is less to say about it, but it provides an introduction to some of the history of Antarctica that we will cover later in the course. And this also serves as a backdrop to the question of what science is actually going on down there and who is down there doing, studying the things we learn about and publishing the research that this course um, is based on. So I have a few announcements because this part um, is shorter and I put them here. Um, the first lab interpreting maps, very heavily drawing on the first half of this lecture, lecture 2A, will um, be released this coming Friday, April 2nd, and be due the following Friday, April 9th at 11.59 PM. And the TAs will have their sections next week. Um, by next Monday, um, you, will have, you will want to have seen both lectures 1 and 2, and to have looked over the lab so that you can get help from a TA if you need. I also wanted to mention that one of our colloquium talks is happening this Thursday, April 1st at um, 2 p.m. And it's actually somewhat related to the topics that we will talk about in this course. Um, a visiting researcher from Columbia University is going to be talking about the connection between changes in submarine hydrothermal activity, or um, which relates to black smokers, and how glaciers have changed. So it's connected to climate change, not directly to Antarctica, but if you, you can attend a talk and write a greater than 400 word response to me and assuming that your everything looks good with your response then you get three points added to your midterm make sure that you include your name when you send me the write-up it's fine to just email it straight to me so nobody claims permanent residency in antarctica um, antarctica has population zero for the most part no indigenous population has ever lived in antarctica if you see art depicting inuit people alongside penguins Outside, unless it's like a modern researcher who happens to be Inuit, they don't really, they didn't traditionally coexist. And penguins and polar bears don't don't coexist either. That's just something that shows up in uh, movies and Coca-Cola ads. Um, it kind of reminds me of the way the Flintstones put dinosaurs and people together, honestly. But a variety of people have come to Antarctica throughout its relatively short human history. But today, the people who live there are either scientists or the support staff who run the research bases, along with a small handful of tourists who are not allowed to stay for extended periods. The population explodes during the summer as scientists all show up to do projects and an even larger crew of support staff comes to pilot their helicopters, cook their meals, keep them in radio contact and whatnot. Um, so that dwindles to less than a thousand people on the entire continent during the winter. Um, Fun fact, a total of 11 people have been born south of the Antarctic Circle, um, or yes, south of the Antarctic Circle, and those have all been at Argentina's Esperanza base or Chile's Montalvo base in the peninsula. Those bases sometimes have people on assignments that last more than one year, and so they do make an exception and allow some people to bring their families. There are actually small schools there for the small number of children there, and a handful of people have been born there. Very few children see Antarctica or can claim it as their birthplace, but a small handful can. Now, Antarctica doesn't have a single country. Um, it is the only landmass on Earth remaining, essentially, that is not widely recognized as being part of a country. A number of countries, mostly in Europe and South America, do have claims. They make territorial claims largely based on sectors of longitude coming from the pole. And you can see that some of these overlap. The truth is that the Antarctic Treaty, which is the main document governing Antarctica that we will learn about more near the end of this course, explicitly bans countries from enforcing their claims or acknowledging other claims. It basically throws all of this out. So Antarctica is more or less, more or less unclaimed by anybody. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the treaty's purpose is to stop countries from building military bases or conducting warfare against other countries, or mining, or like, or extracting oil or minerals and claiming them for their country. And there is, in fact, one sector of Antarctica that is not claimed at all. It is um, it is known as Terra Nullius, and it is one of two places on Earth that is not claimed by any country. Um, the other one, fun fact, is this little uninhabited um, bit called Bir Tawil on the border between Egypt and Sudan. And it's because there's a border dispute where they each one claims this triangle over here, the Habaib Triangle, which has which actually has people in it. And then the the map basically is drawn either so that Sudan is like this or that Egypt or that Egypt is like this. 
basically neither of them wants Beer Tawil, and nobody actually lives there. Um, this guy from the United States actually tried to claim it once and declared his daughter the princess, and he actually went there and put his flag there, and it's just like, what are you doing? Nobody took him seriously. Um, honestly, it's funny to me because some people who went to Antarctica did similar things before the treaty was put in place. What the treaty does, though, is that it means that the countries that have research bases, those there are countries that have research bases that aren't actually countries that make claims. The United States does not have a claim, and it has um, a large base, McMurdo base, within Ross dependency. Um, now, there are a number of islands known as the Subantarctic Islands, which are formally defined as the islands south of the Antarctic Convergence. However, some other islands that are associated with Antarctica historically, or that are just right outside the Convergence, are also informally considered to be Subantarctic Islands sometimes. These islands are often more free of ice due to their small size, which means that they're surrounded by ocean water and there's much more ice-free land on them. Also, they are slightly farther north, and they are actually where a lot of the famous Antarctic wildlife lives. Seals, penguins, a lot of the birds, and more plants actually live on the subantarctic islands than on the continent proper. So the famous penguins actually breed heavily on places like South Georgia Island, and um, one thing we'll come back to is that part of Antarctica's human history is very heavily related to sealing and whaling. Um, and a lot of sealing and whaling stations were established on some of these islands. And the various subantarctic islands are actually claimed by different continents. They're not directly affected by the treaty, but all of them besides the Falkland Islands have no permanent population at this point. The only people living there are research and occasionally military staff. South Georgia and some of these other islands will figure prominently also into stories like that of Shackleton. Um, and I have a couple of examples just to introduce now before they come up later in the history section. I don't need you to memorize the list on the previous page, but here are a few of the ones that figure prominently. The Falkland Islands, which are the only islands that have a permanent population, are actually much closer to South America than they are to Antarctica. Um, and there is actually a small population. There's a couple thousand British citizens living there. They're home to a number of penguin species. Um, there's also a lot of sheep on there. You can see there's actually a sheep on the flag. That's one of the big economic activities on the islands. And they have been a source of contention between the UK and Argentina because Argentina actually tried to settle them um, after it gained independence from Spain. There's never been an indigenous population on them. They're quite far from, they're actually relatively far from South America and the, the waters between Southern South America and the Falklands are stormy. Um, but after this, the British drove them off and established their own settlement. So Argentina has never been happy about that. Not to mention that there are oil and gas reserves in the ocean off the island, and that actually led to a war between Argentina and the United Kingdom in the 20th century, the Falklands War. Going farther south, you have South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands. And South Georgia is one of the larger islands, um, and it is no longer inhabited by a permanent population. Um, and the South Sandwich Islands, which are volcanic islands, are completely uninhabited. But South Georgia used to have a big presence of whaling and sealing. It has a number of ruins of former whaling stations. One of them, Grytviken, is still more or less intact and preserved as a historical artifact. And um, another station, Stromness on South Georgia, is where Shackleton was headed towards when he made his daring escape from Antarctica. Um, he would later actually be buried on South Georgia after dying during a later expedition there. And um, he is buried in Gritviken, and tourists passing through South Georgia can visit his grave. There's about 20 people there in the summer doing science and maintaining the museum at Gritviken. Um, in the Southern Indian Ocean, meanwhile, um, you have the Kerguelen Islands, which are one of the, also one of the larger islands. They're um, the only part of um, a large volcanic plateau that sticks above the water. There used, there used to be much more of them exposed, but it's been sinking. And um, they are one of the most isolated places on Earth. If you look closely at the if you look closely at the diagram here, you can see just how darn far it is from Madagascar, Africa, and um, Australia. Um, so they've never had a permanent, they've never had an indigenous population either, but they were very heavily settled for whaling and sealing. And even though now they're only inhabited by scientists, they are still controlled by France and administered as part of what is known as the French Southern and Antarctic Territories. And that technically includes France's claim on mainland Antarctica, 
Adeli land, which they can't really enforce. And today the Kerguelen Islands are home to a rich biodiversity of seals, whales, and seabirds, and penguins. And the seal and whale populations have rebounded somewhat since the era of sealing and whaling drove them to near extinction. Um, Captain, Captain Cook stopped there during one of his world voyages, and a number of the other explorers um, stopped there early on. Um, they've also shown up in literature. Um, one of the few books written about Antarctica, um, Edgar Allan Poe, most famous for writing short stories and poems, wrote a single complete novel called The Adventures of the Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. Um, and the titular character is a whaler, and Mr. Poe was pretty darn familiar with the, with the whaling companies in New England. And the title of the character actually gets stranded there. Um, um, there is actually a native species of cabbage in Kerguelen that is edible and has saved people from starvation on a number of occasions. Um, and one last set that will come up is the Prince Edward Islands, which are two uninhabited islands notable mostly because of an unauthorized nuclear test that occurred there in the 1970s. So that's a bit of a summary of what geopolitically is going on with the subantarctic islands. But the continent itself is pretty much only inhabited by scientific staff. The only settlements on mainland Antarctica are research bases, such as McMurdo, which is the main US base. And McMurdo is by far the largest base. It may host as many as 1,500 people, or the size of a small town in the US in the summer. But most bases have at most a few hundred people in the summer, and just a couple, just 20 or 30 people maybe in the winter, if even that. And again, one does not have to have a claim in Antarctica to have a base there. You can see that Japan, the People's Republic of China, India, um, and um, Peru, and a number of countries that don't have claims have bases built down there. And indeed, the United States does not have a claim. And um, McMurdo Base is built in um, the Ross, what is technically the Ross Dependency, which is claimed but not really enforced, enforceably claimed by New Zealand. And then Palmer Station in the peninsula is um, another US base that is in an area that is variously claimed by Chile, Argentina, and the UK. You can see that most of the bases are along the coast because it's easier to access them, and that there's a very high concentration in the peninsula and the surrounding islands because of the richness of wildlife there and also because it's significantly more balmy and habitable. And really, the Antarctic Treaty is why this can, why this can be the case. The Antarctic Treaty allows stations to be built kind of wherever because Antarctica is meant to be for everyone according to the treaty and individual claims are not enforced. The United States has three permanent bases. There's McMurdo Base in Southern Victoria land, there's Amundsen Scott Base at the South Pole, and there's Palmer Station on the peninsula, um, which the US used to call the Palmer Peninsula, but nobody else, nobody else calls it that. Uh, and McMurdo is where the vast majority of people going to Antarctica come through unless they're going to the bases in the peninsula. It's the closest thing to a city Antarctica has, although it can really feel much more like a mining camp just because it's so industrial and you have heavy equipment and it gets really muddy when the ice starts to melt um, in the summer. And you do have some research happening nearby. You have Mount Erebus, so you have volcanology research going on, and it's also close to some seal and penguin populations. But to a big extent, it serves as a base camp for the research that occurs on the ice shelf, out in the dry valleys, and in the Transantarctic Mountains. And then they also will establish field camps further inland to support research happening farther from the coast. And McMurdo is kind of the base camp for that. And for Antarctica, it's quite luxurious. You have heated buildings, a pretty good cafeteria, honestly, with pizza. You have a gym, several saunas, bars, a post office, and a lot of things you could want to make to, to help you to help you feel comfortable there. And many of the people working there, most of them actually are not scientists. They're the population who is there to keep the science running because you need a very large workforce to make that happen. And for every one scientist at McMurdo, I would say you meet about 10 people who are there to somehow support the scientists. You have people cooking and washing the dishes like my friend, Julie, um, who I met through a mutual friend who knows me through an anime site I used to write reviews for and her through the bird watching community in Texas. Then you have people who are firefighters, since fire is a real danger because of how windy it is. I met a firefighter who part of the time worked at McMurdo, and when he was off season, actually, he piloted a helicopter for firefighting for the National Park Service, actually at Channel Islands National Park near Santa Barbara, which is a funny coincidence. Um, speaking of helicopters, you have the people 
who fly the helicopters, maintain them, and also serve as the techs who help unload gear for, for people's field groups. You have people who are there to serve as the hairdresser or the priest. Um, you have some people there for medical services, just in case. Um, not anything super fancy, but they have, they have a medical staff there. And then you have the radio operators um, who are in charge of staying in contact with people and monitoring that people are still alive. And then you have the people who offer field equipment and so on and so forth. And one thing I like about some of the documentaries that I show in this class is that the, they give you a sense of what kinds of people end up in Antarctica. It's not just people who are there to do research. That's how I ended up there, but I talked to a number of people who had much, much different backgrounds while I was there, and the documentaries also give you some insight into that. Um, McMurdo Base is close by Scott Base, which is not to be confused with Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. It's the smaller um, New Zealand base, essentially right over the hill from it. Um, and that's very rare for two bases to be that close together. Actually, most bases are much, much more isolated. Um, and McMurdo is also near a number of interesting historical facts, like the hut that, be that belonged to Robert Falcon Scott, as well as a cross that commemorates um, his death at the, um, during his attempt to reach the South Pole. And Ross Island, it turns out, was a good place for people to establish base, and it was where many of the early heroic age explorations either based themselves or started from when they were on their way to the South Pole. And indeed, there is actually a road to the South Pole now um, that is significantly safer than the road, than the route that they had to take. But here's a bit of an overview of McBurdo. You can see that Scott Base is over Observation Hill. And Observation Hill is a small volcanic mountain. It's not active now, but um, there's a lot of cool volcanic rocks around here. And then McMurdo is over here. Uh, fun fact, there was actually a nuclear reactor here for a while, and then people decided that having nuclear waste in Antarctica was not a good idea, so it was never put into operation. And again, some scenes from around McMurdo, icebreaker ships, um, the dock, ice dock, and then an overview of what is essentially Antarctica's only city. On the opposite side of the continent, you have a much smaller station. It looks almost like a, filling, like a fishing village when you look at it, and there's only going to be about 20 to 30 people working there in the summer. They, there is some marine research that occurs there, but to a large extent, it's a service station for the United States' research vessels. And the US Antarctic program has two vessels, the Nathaniel B. Palmer and the Lawrence M. Gold, that are enormous, and scientists will live on them for weeks or months at a time and, and perform research. They'll also drop scientists off at field camps on the subantarctic islands. Some other, um, some other people from my department who did different research in Antarctica were studying um, sediments on the subantarctic islands and they went to Palmer Station first and then the research vessel picked them up there and dropped them off um, on one of the islands while it was on while it was making a round in the area. And essentially these are floating laboratories. Um, you have research of marine sediments, research of seawater chemistry, research of the speed of the Antarctic circumpolar current, and lots of other stuff going on there. At the South Pole, meanwhile, there is a station that is kind of a single, it looks like a single warehouse on stilts, honestly. And many of the people there are doing climatology research or they're working with astronomy because you have really good visibility of the stars and the southern lights in the winter. I also met somebody there who was temporarily staying at McMurdo and he was um, going to do neutrino counting because there's so little pollution there. Um, it turns out there's a lot of physics research there. And everyone, almost everyone who goes there passes through McMurdo first. The flights land at McMurdo, you get settled there, and then you take a plane um, to South Pole Base. But there is now a road um, that goes from McMurdo to South Pole Base. It is very slow to go on. It takes 40 days to get there, um, less time to get back because you're going downhill. But it's generally used just for supplying equipment because you don't want to spend, you don't want to waste 40 days on the road unless you, unless you're the one person driving the truck. And it was the first permanent Antarctic research station built in the interior, um, and also the first US station built. Um, it was built during the International Geophysical Year, which we'll learn about later, and it was a concentrated period in which Antarctic research really got going, which there were a lot of research projects. It has actually been completely rebuilt since then um, to be more environmentally efficient. We won't have time to go over other countries' stations in that much detail, unfortunately, but this map gives you a sense of where they are and it tells you that most of them are on the coasts with a handful of exceptions. Um, as a bit of a fun example, I once watched an anime series called A Place Further Than the Universe, where a number of Japanese high school students go to Antarctica with a research group, which is 
Not something that happens commonly, but it's not that ridiculous compared to some other anime premises. Um, and actually the depiction of Showa Station, which is actually the main Japanese research station is pretty similar to what it looks like in real life, which I think is kind of adorable. One station that is not used anymore is the Pole of Inaccessibility Station. I mentioned the Pole of Inaccessibility is as far as you can get in Antarctica from the oceans. And Russia, which was then known as the Soviet Union or the USSR, established a base there during the, interna during the International Geophysical Year as a way to also have a base in the interior and compete in the science and space race. But they pretty soon determined that it wasn't actually useful for very much because it was too far from anything. And so it was abandoned within a few years and it has since been almost entirely covered by snow. You can see there was this tower with a statue of Lenin built and in 2008, 50 years later, that statue was all that was sticking above the snow. The current main Russian station is Vostok station located above Lake Vostok. Um, and it is colder than the South Pole there because it is so far from the ocean. It is one of the most miserably cold places on earth. Um, and a very small hardy crew of 15 people in the winter, 30-ish people in the summer do climatology research as well as what research they can into the conditions of the subglacial lake far, far underneath the station. Um, but it is a very windy place and it's also very dark. You have 85 continuous days of near complete darkness much more than you get at McMurdo. Another station I wanted to mention is one that I think is kind of cool because it was built um, kind of as a pod or it looks almost like a space station. And you'll notice this station, Halley Station, is built on stilts. Um, it was constructed over the ice shelf, um, one of the extensions of the glaciers over the ocean. And the idea was that the stilts would reduce the amount of space that was in contact with the ice and thus reduce heating costs. Um, sadly, it's fallen victim to climate change because even though the ice shelves are thought of as being permanent features, they are starting to break apart a little more because of global climate change. And so because of concerns over cracks in the ice, they have not left a winter staff there since 2017. And it's very hard to leave Antarctica during the winter. It's not safe to fly a plane in and out of the continent during the winter. And if you're overwintering, you are essentially stuck there. So they didn't want to commit, they didn't want to possibly put their staff at risk of a death sentence by having the station fall into the ice and having people be stranded in West Antarctica or in this part of East Antarctica, miles from any other station. So one aspect of climate change hitting Antarctica. The last thing I want to mention is time in Antarctica, which I think is kind of a fun fact. Time zones are kind of arbitrary in general. Time is defined by longitude, but if you look at a map of the United States time zones, you'll notice they don't run perfectly vertically. Like for example, there's two counties in Indiana that are within central time because they're economically connected with Chicago, even though the rest of Indiana is in Eastern time and how the Western part of o the Oklahoma panhandle observes mountain time. And so um, to avoid, so with Antarctica, there came the issue of how are we going to demarcate time zones? So in Antarctica, the time zones have nothing to do with time zones in Africa or South America or any inhabited areas. Um, if you have a map, you can figure it out pretty easily the time where you are. You just have to have this map because it's a bit arbitrarily defined. You'll notice that the sector you'll notice that they don't correspond really that well to longitude at all. And partially that's done because of where countries' bases are. Um, you'll notice that this sort of pink, um, red and pink hatched design is both around the South Pole and along the coast of Victoria Land. And that's because there are two US bases that coordinate a lot of stuff between them located respectively at the South Pole and in Victoria Land. Um, and so what they do is they take universal time coordinated, which is, um, which is kind of, um, which is solar time. It's measured in reference to the sun at the prime meridian and it's treated as sort of the standard for time. And then they define times in Antarctica as hours past UTC or hours behind UTC. So it has nothing to do with say relevance to time in South America um, or time in, time in Africa. It's defined just by a unit of time taken at the equator. So again, it's, it's it's based on universal time coordinated or solar time. And you really need a map to really know where, what time you are in Antarctica, unless you've been there for a long time. And that is all for the human geography for now. Next week, I'm going to apply some of what we learned about the physical geography to talking about Antarctica's climate. And I'll begin with a general overview of how climate is linked to circulation and talk about how that affects Antarctica. So I will see you next week.
And again, find me in office hours or shoot me an email if you have any questions.